Barry Sharpless was born in 1941 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. He was awarded a PhD from Stanford University, California in 1968 and is now active as professor at Scripps Research, La Jolla, California, USA. So please join me in, in please <laughs> join me in welcoming Dr. Sharpless up on up on stage. Introduction and, uh, and ladies and gentlemen and friends and former students and colleagues out there too. Uh, it's a, uh, a unique feeling. Uh, it's awe-inspiring to have two lectures that that I, of course, understood every word of, but also that I couldn't have given myself because they are so beautifully organized. And uh, that's my feeling. And in life, I can't plan things. So uh, some things need to be fixed up in the final written version of this. But I, I have some, thing, some observations to share. What I really like to share is uh, how the three of us were wisely chosen by this committee because uh, we have the same spirit that we've evolved from our experiences over, a, well, in my case, a longer lifetime, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's a profound thing to realize what you can do if you don't try to just do any old way of making molecules. And uh, that, that's the main message I can <clears throat> give you. So I don't know, is this a forward and reverse thing too? Or, um, okay, so yeah, th this is the uh, launching of click chemistry. And it started before there was any really uh, motivation for uh, knowing that it would work, but, but I did know that some reactions were better than others. And anybody who's been a chemist for years, like Mor Morton and I have, uh, uh, know that you don't really uh, have much faith in a reaction that's never given you more than 10, 20% yield. Why would you consider using it in a plan? So even if you're planning your synthesis very carefully, uh, there's only about a handful of reactions that good chemists would know, okay, I can go to the bank with this one, we, I think. Uh, here, here's the way it started in, uh, let's see, how do I push the laser pointer? Oh, it's right there, okay. So this is where click chemistry started in this old building which had pigeons in it and stuff. And we cleared it out and built some labs in there with Alfred Bader's funding, Alfred and Isabel Bader, uh, two, two uh, well, Alfred, he was coming around to Dartmouth College even and to Stanford with, uh, with his patched elbow suit and his candy out coffee cups and uh, our generation knows who Alfred Bader is. Other, uh, younger people, like I'm, I'm sure Keller never ran into him in that role, but uh, he, he was the man who said, what can I do for you? Uh, he was a man making chemicals for sale, and how many would go around door to door like that? But that's the way he was, and he started his lab in a garage in, uh, I forget which city in the Midwest. And he is an important man who decided he like oh, and Victor Sneekis at uh, the Queen's College in Canada, uh, he, he's indebted to Alfred too, because he endowed a big chair for Victor, who was another wonderful chemist who, uh, who uh, I've admired for years. Uh, and Hartmuth Kolb is here in the audience, and Hartmuth was the first click chemist, because he, he came back from Siba Geige when it merged, uh, he was, had been a postdoc in the lab. He came back from Sibagai when it merged with Novartis, um, with uh, whatever the other guy was, Sando, and became Novartis. And you know, when something like that happens, you know, the quality's going down. And, and Hartmuth got out of there wisely, and he, he started organizing a chemical group, and he made hundreds of blocks, building blocks for uh, for chemists to have versatility in, in discovery chemistry. 
They thought these blocks were actually supposed to be small drugs or something in Japan. It just was ahead of its time. It didn't have, it didn't have any, uh, any, any precedent for working. And so people didn't know what we were trying to sell. And, and somebody bought the company to make it into a drug supply line for their own uh, new startup pharma company. Mm. So Hartmuth left again. And okay, now this is the man who made it possible for click chemistry. It may not be known to many people, but I couldn't get funded very well because I don't write grants very well. And uh, I could never get funded for uh, doing uh, click chemistry. They hated it at the NIH and the study sections. They wanted total synthesis or complex uh, problem, uh, uh, very complex hammer and tong ways of making uh, big molecules in those days. So I, I uh, Richard rescued me, he saw my potential, and he funded click chemistry. 90% of all the funding for click chemistry came from from Richard's rich friends and uh, that he could constantly uh, get this aboard his institute. Uh, my wife, when our fifth anniversary, well, she's the genius in the family. Uh, I won a Nobel Prize, but everybody knows she's the genius. And uh, she, she names things like click chemistry and sleeping beauty, but her, 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 her click chemistry uh, it's always stuck, and it di didn't. St it stuck in the craw of a lot of people for years because it wasn't popular. Uh, it, it just uh, didn't it didn't appeal to people. It seemed Mickey Mouse. And anyway, um, I can't say that I would be here today, or I would have been here the last time either, if it weren't for Jan. And I don't know where anybody's sitting. I get nervous, so I'll just say, "Oh, oh, good, good, over there." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, she keeps me connected to the real world. And besides also having really in incredibly, she's a writer and she's trained, she's an English major writer. Um, now, is this, I guess I don't know how to change this. Let's see, how do you, how do you make this? <laughs> I can't get the normal thing to, what, what is it? Uh, Maybe, maybe I should start it again. Uh, uh, just go back and try, try, try to do it for, without the comments. Uh, okay, then I go. Uh, let's just go this way and see. No, it's going to go that. Okay. There. Oh, wait a minute. What happened? What? So I was born to be a process chemist. I was a fisherman uh, from Nor Norwegian, uh, Swedish fishing family. Uh, my grandparents and I worked on fishing boats until I was ready to go to college. And, and actually, even while that time, before I went to Stanford for graduate school. And so I like catching things and uh, interesting things. And also quantity was important when you're fishing for commercial reasons. So a process chemist, I'm not interested in little tiny scale reactions. I mean, I can do them and understand the meaning of them for analysis, but I want to make a handful of something and uh, so that I can do something, whatever I want with it, and just put it on the shelf as a reagent. So that's what a process chemist does. And um, so simplicity, my lifelong mission was to was to make things faster. I'm very impatient in the lab, and my son Will, who works, he's here, who worked in the lab a year and a half. He's like me. We make things quickly, and they crash out, and we go on. And uh, so, the asymmetric oxidation got me interested in 
in, uh, well, that's, this is not quite written the way I would. Uh, it, the, the main thing about I learned was came from George Hammett, a nonlinear thinker who worked, was a professor and came back to work at uh, Exxon for years. It's not we're making compounds that we're interested in. Uh, we, there's not, no sense to making compounds. There's too many of them. But it's the making of properties. You've got to find properties. That's the magic of chemistry. We have properties all around us we haven't made yet, things that are easy to make. And that's what click chemistry has helped. Yeah. Now, this is why I'm disorganized, probably, because I, but the periodic table was very helpful to me. I dove into it as a kid in high school or even before in grammar school, and I, I, I read it all about every element and its properties and does it react with water, or I just needed to know about everybody. And of course, a lot of these things you can't find anything out about. Uh, you go and um, look for things up here you won't find. Well, Syria, these are okay. These are important today, and uh, countries fighting over them. Uh, but uh, the transition metals really set us off during my lifetime. But, you know, I'm not so enamored of them right now. Uh, and copper, of course, is in never, never land here between the main group and, the, and copper is really, really special. It, it's very slippery. It, it, you can't stop it. it. It's everywhere in our body at atom molar concentration. And so there's plenty of copper if we can learn to house it better to do the chemistry that Carolyn and uh, Morton would like to do even when the heart is beating. Elements in the table that I particularly have a relationship with is selenium. Uh, that came for an uh, interesting reason. MIT, I thought I needed to write an NIH grant because I didn't think an NIH grant would support chemistry. That's how naive I was. So I, wrote, I went out to Wisconsin for two months, learned from the experts on selenium biochemistry, came back, wrote an NIH grant, and then selenium, uh, this proceeded to discover that selenium was fascinating, uh, ke simple chemistry, making olefins. So in two years of doing that on the side, it got me tenured at MIT. Okay, so Derek Barton was a friend and advisor to me. I liked his way of looking for new reactivity. And um, I, I was actually told by him I couldn't stop doing asymmetric chemistry if I wanted to win a Nobel Prize, which I thought was, uh, <laughs> as I was Derek's point of view. And, and I was looking to get out of it because I can't stay on something very long. But went on for a while. Did the Hartmuth came and we and we uh, really did a job on the asymmetric ap uh, epoxidation, uh, dihydroxylation. That was probably the best reaction I've ever seen for catalytic oxidation. Um, I put this in for those who. I'll leave it in the written version. And it just enumerates the events. Epoxidation was fine. And it sidetracked me with chirality. But chirality wasn't what I was interested in. I was interested in making efficient bonds. And I found out more and more the only bonds that matter are the bonds between things that are separate, like people. <laughs> the first, they get in the same room, maybe they hold hands, that's like Velcro. And, but then eventually, if you're wearing the right bracelets, there's a click, and then you're t together forever. But when you put two things together, molecules, modules, that's where the properties come from. That's what nature teaches us. But we don't have the right to build things the way nature does, top down. She's making big molecules that, whose sole reverential involvement so is to control themselves and the other guys to make the right connections. And so no, but we can start at the bottom. That's our privilege. We start at the bottom with a few things. Maybe we need a few thousand because we don't have all this massive territory we can cover, but we can come up from the bottom 
and make function. And that function can be affordable for hopefully much more people than, than a biotechnology could possibly imagine being. Uh, anyway, I made some enemies in this world. Enemies came heavily from saying the grail of carbon-carbon bond formation was perhaps a false grail, and I would defend that to this day, but let's not get involved in that. That probably set back click chemistry's acceptance for years. Um, and MG came, uh, he was a great student during the asymmetric oxidation and was the man who did the mechanism at MIT, but he was in Virginia, and then Richard Lerner lo loved MG when he was out on sabbatical, and he hired him as a, a professor at Scripps, and then MG and I got together, and uh, we had, let's see now, like, <laughs> I'm just gonna jump to the end whenever I get in trouble, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> overnight, uh, so Richard, uh, he, he just, um, Richard loved this project too. It was the idea of, look, why don't we let the enzyme take 50 pieces on each side and do the cycloaddition, the azide carolins thing, where you get this very weak, uh, we skin our hero, all of us, because of his great being. Physical organic chemists are much more important than people realize, and we didn't do them much good in the last 50 years, so I suggest we worry about them again in the future to help us. But so, so the enzyme can hold this thing together, and this cycloaddition could incre increase its likelihood. But it seems very pathetic, because the concentrations we had of the pieces, and you'll see them in the next slide, this is what MG and I decided to do. Oh, that's our first article on the click. That's the manifesto that was written for click chemistry when we didn't even have a perfect reaction. So we were kind of making it up as we went along here, what might be, but we didn't have those reactions at, at that time. And where is my, no. Okay, Th this inspired MG and I, and Reza Gadiri, a, colleague, a beloved colleague at MIT, uh, uh, bought a copy of Kevin Kelly's book, Out of Control. If you haven't read Kevin Kelly's book, you've got to read it. Even though it's written in 96 or 94, it's still relevant today to what life is that a lot of us don't think of about life. And um, life is out of control, of course. Naturally, if it were in control, who would be controlling it? And it would fail uh, if, if it had some human controlling it. Uh, so Kevin Kelly says, nothing is more addicting than God games. He's got a chapter on God games. And don't get me wrong, these God games are, are not irreverent. Sim Earth, Sim City, whatever. But your first rule about God games that you learn is to be a God, you have to relinquish control. You set down your system, and you watch it. <laughs> well, I mean, those games sound really hard to imagine succeeding. And um, so we were out walking on the beach that, uh, at Scripps a few days later after reading the copies of the book Aunt Reza gave us, and we both uh, said, well, what did you make of this book? What did you like? And we both loved the God game part because we realized there was a question where you could really see a problem because everybody takes x-rays of big molecules and they're sitting still frozen to death with their mates at minus hundreds Kelvin. And, and then we make predictions about how we're gonna stick something in this hole and other things we take. Uh, but it's like try, the ugly stepsisters trying to get into the Cinderella slipper. You know, they, they, they're breaking everything. They, and so humans are trying to design the finished product. Oh, you're stable in water, you could be a drug. That's really arrogant when you think about it. So what about if you let the molecule take a couple parts and somehow it can make a connection that's permanent. So the molecule can, can act as a reaction vessel. And that's, uh, well, chemical face is big. This, this is something that everybody knows about today. I, I give Derek some credit here. I, I should mention uh, Regina Bohacek, Colin McMartin, and Wayne Guida, who also had an elegant 
story on this, how the mass of the universe uh, that we can see, the visible universe, could be occupied by one molecule of every possible drug that was less than 500 molecular weight, and it wouldn't be any, any matter left over to work with. So it's absurd how much stuff there could be. Um, so my guess is about 99.99% of space close to us, two or three steps away, four steps away from things we could execute to have good, perfect reactions that could make, uh, that could make a useful molecule strike into a real, real functional molecule. But that uh, most, were, uh, the screen is the problem. This is where I would say we should, that's my insight from the last few days. I thought, you know, the biggest problem we have is screens. I mean, how are you going to discover, I better, I have to stop, right? Uh, 10 minutes, okay. Well, I got some extra time from the failure. Okay, thank you. Uh, so how are we going to, screen for something. I don't know what you want out of a chemical. Everybody might have their own magic chemical uh, interest uh, for function for, from a human being or a, an animal. But, but it's the, how do you screen for that? You're not allowed to screen directly in humans legally, uh, so that's a problem. But there are other things too, like uh, how to make a building uh, just overall have so something that makes it last 100 years longer than wood for falling down. Cor corrosion in concrete, or uh, you'll see what happened to me. Most of the chemists, we think about life, especially since, per uh, um, well, Berzelius uh, put, put us into thinking about life as organic chemistry, which was a very misleading thing. And, Absolutely absurd, of course, but uh, but that's okay. He did some great things for chemistry, and but his own student Wohler proved him wrong, of course, that from Germany, a postdoc. Oh, so here, here's the in situ with uh, fancy Mike Peake at Scripps could make anything look great. Richard Lerner loved him, and and this is the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, and here it is making in its in its guts, this thing that MG and I worked on together, uh, making the triazole, uh, clicking it together in its heart, and the inhibitor that came out was, was uh, I'm gonna have to jump over this one, because what, what, what was the inhibitor, why? Okay, maybe that'll come later, but the inhibitor was, was femtomolar, and, and it went down as low as two femtomolar. I mean, and this was the most potent inhibitor ever made for almost any enzyme, but let alone for, for acetylcholinesterase. So that, that was a real, the first inhibitor we ever made in my lab, and it was made by MG and Warren Lewis uh, and Luke Green, that was femtomolar. And that's pretty remarkable, from 50 pieces on each side. So there were a lot of combinations. Uh, yeah. Certainty of, ch of molecular chance. Well, when we started doing this, this assembly of modules, we found out right, we ran head on into a problem. The best reactions that were out there were far from good enough. And here, I'll just run the show this slowly, quickly. Here, here's the quickest way we found MG and Hartmuth and I working in Jan in the last few days to figure out, because we had other ways of explaining this. But here, if I have a perfect reaction, what, what does it look like? Well, it actually looks like this. After 1,000, you can do this in the computer. You find this thing you put in, and it takes it to the power from, from 1 up to 1,000 or higher, whatever you want to do. So here it is. If you do 1,000 steps in a row, with a 99% yield, and most organic chemists are gonna to go to the bank with this kind of a reaction. And in, in solid phase synthesis, Morton could tell me, they, they don't leave that even, they just use excess reagent, right? And so 99% yield, this is what it buys you after 1,000 serial steps, you're down to 0 
And th now I come to 99.9, .9, I get up to here. 99.99, I'm here. But to get to 99% after a thousand steps, this is polymer chemistry, right? And here you have 99.99, uh, .99 usually helps to have another nine. Uh, and the thing almost never fades. And that's what this new reaction is like. And it's a polymer reaction. So, okay, let me, let me just get through to that. This is the reaction that's magic and came into our lap with Jia Jia Dong. It's a suffix reaction. What happens is silicon, phosphorus, and sulfur love to, to, ch to change ligands with a suffix catalyst. And they, they do it as fast as the QAC reaction, if you can believe it. Room temperature, 130 degrees, it doesn't matter. The reaction doesn't even get, explode when it's done neat. And it's a polymer reaction. Um, and here, here is the uh, early team that published that. And oh, Pong has been working for a long time with me now at Scripps. He came back, uh, he was a student who came back as a professor at Scripps. And we work on the polymer together. Here's MG, who's been involved in suffix chemistry and click chemistry from the beginning. Almost Hartmuth, of course, was really at the very beginning. Here's Jia Zha Dong and Larissa Ket Krasnova on this suffix chemistry. Now, what I want to show you is just how the polymer, you melt the polymer together, the two monomers, crystalline, melt them together, and then you put the catalyst in, it makes the polymer, you pump, you put some more DMF in, you put DMF in, and then you pump it into a, a stirred solution. Jia Jia here is showing, you get a, it, it crashes out in methanol. You wind it up. He called it bird net, net soup, uh, bird net polymer. It's a beautiful polymer. Very, very f good fidelity. Okay, I know I'm running out of time here. But here you can see, no, I have no time, right? Oh, okay. Uh, so 500. Here's another type we make from another gas from sulfur, the, the tetrafluoride. And this, this polymer is, is very, very easy to make. And, and it forms perfectly. And, and it has this extra spot where we can put, we put AZT out there with, with a connection through a QAC. And so we had this huge molecule of 500 uh, thymidines on it. Uh, you know, every spot had a thymidine sticking out. And it was a helical structure. Uh, and if we didn't have this yield up here at 99.998, we wouldn't have gotten this yield. I'm sure this yield's too high, but even if it was 98, you can see the massive amount of yield you get out of this reaction. And here's the NMRs. The NMRs are ridiculous. This is a molecule with 500 units connecting, and this is the proton NMR, and this is the reference for fluorine. That's the, ref that's the fluorine at, at 500 megahertz, or whatever the resonance frequency is, but it's just like one fluorine. And these got chiral centers in them, and they're helices. Here's what the thing looks like. Han Zuloth is our collaborator in the Netherlands, and, uh, at, and he, his students got these pictures of, of these helices. The, the pitch of some of the, they know the pitch of them. Each of these will have like a, a, a nucleotide sticking out every, every turn. Every, it's a pitch is about 12 degrees. Uh, but the main point is that, that this is DNA, of course, and that's another nice polymer with sulfate, phosphates affinities, but when you look at this from outer space and you come in and you're smart, and you're looking at somebody shows you that, you'd say, well, those are f f phosphates or sulfates. You can't tell by looking at them because they're either neutral or they have a minus one charge. Just to remind you that this chemistry that's helical is also related to life's chemistry. And finally, this is what I wanted to say. We ran head on into an uh, amazing thing. It, it, we've been trying to do biochemistry, but 
I never did polymer chemistry before, and I found it very hard to do. I didn't understand the arguments, and we got tremendous help from Molecular Foundry at Berkeley. That, and Carolyn used to run that, Molecular Foundry. Can you imagine? She does every, she, jack of all trades, I guess. But Yi, Yi Lu is a former student with MG and I, at, uh, and Yi has uh, been there for 10, 10 years or so, and we, Pong knew him, and we got going. They would measure our polymers, our polysulfate polymers. And the main thing about these polysulfates is they are more immortal. As much as you might say a sulfate looks like a weak wimp link, this thing is not coming apart in vivo. It's just stable. So it's just a connector. And, and here's what it does. If you make this polymer, and then you use it to make uh, these films. You just dissolve it and dissolve it and make films. And you put those films on capa as capacitors. On, this was uh, Yi and his student Henry's idea because they had experience with capacitors under duress, under high heat and high temperature. And we don't have good ones right now. So what you make is sort of wrapped up coils of these films and wrap them around the zone where the horrible things are happening in, in a Tesla or a, or a power station. Uh, if you have a capacitor, it has to load its charge and then wham, drop. It will drop and if it leaks, and it, you get heat and you get so much heat that you can't function anymore, and the high field doesn't help either. They're both against you. So what we found was something amazing, I thought. This is the, one of the polymers we made, and we made it to have a high TG so that we could have a high temperature, and uh, these are the gold electrodes, and the film that's laid down on those uh, is our polysulfate film, it's clear, and then you wrap it around uh, in so, so a way that you can run the field through it, and it, at 150 degrees, 750 volts, it, it, it gives the polysulfate is way up there ahead of all the ones used in electric cars now or, or for any purpose where you need survival of this electric sort of, it, it's an insulator, but it holds the charge and that drops it. Drop, loads dropped. So we ran it uh, 50,000 times over three hours and it just runs straight. straight. There's no decay, and, and if we want, we can show that they showed that if you wound it, then it has to, it, it makes a short, and then it, you, you do a few square wave cycles, and it comes back on a reproducible cycle, a reproducible cycle, and it loses maybe one or two percent because it healed itself. It just burned up the part that wasn't any good, and now it's back to being a healthy, uh, capacitor material. So this was a complete intrusion into my life of physics, and I thought that was really a cool thing because how, how physics, especially physics with fields, right? Electromagnetic fields. This is magic. It's action at a distance. How the hell is this problem? What well, we know, we think we know, and, and uh, how it's working. And we're going. We're after that now. And. A man in Germany, uh, Dietmar Stahlke, who's one of the few people I think understands main group chemistry bonding silica, aluminum, silicon, sulfur, and uh, phosphorus and sulfur. That's really messed up, that bonding, as it stands now in our life as chemists. So his way of looking at it, he can explain why this thing is not conducting this phosphorus-sulfur linkages will resist conduction. There are no pi bonds. Most people, we all draw them as pi bonds. Oh, pi bonds. There are no pi bonds there. So that's the end, but I, I just had to get th that last message out that the certainty of chance, this is the certainty of chance that Jan uh, wanted me to introduce because I, I, I just, uh, uh, I can't get over how, how much chance when you can make things quickly and you can test them against something reasonable, 
your certainty of chance is huge, right? I mean, you, you, do you intuit that? Uh, that's where. But that's why I think it's important that certainly a chance, and that's from a, a guy who is a jazz musician, and, and he, uh, uh, the first person to say that he believed in the certainty of chance, he was a, um, oh, I can't remember, the, it, the, the Dadaist type movement, and uh, you know, the fact that uh, well, life is one of the chances, that we see here in front of us is one of the chances this universe offered and it's occupied. Sorry for all the lack of order, but uh, I just thought, oh, th and I, th humble thanks to my, all my wonderful students and postdocs and visiting professors and click collaborators and, and, uh, and I'm gonna get the names out there, of course, in a long list in the paper, but I, I couldn't get them together for today. So I apologize, but the ending uh, was the main part of the story. It's certainly a chance again. <laughs> Thank you. Stay, stay, stay on stage. Okay. So we should stay up here, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barry, for that fantastic and awe-inspiring talk. Right? And may I now call back uh, Dr. Bertosi and Dr. Meldal to come back on stage so we can all thank all three laureates for their fantastic <laughs> lectures and accomplishments. <laughs> you should come up. You should come up. It's, 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 Okay. <laughs>